Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm geeking out a little bit, just a little bit, because I have Liam Toomey from The Athletic On. He's one of my favorite journalists. Liam, I read almost all of your columns, all of your articles. So it's honestly such a pleasure to have you on here to talk all things Chelsea. Thank you so, so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm good, yeah. Thanks for reading. Um, it's always a co I always feel complimented when people say that, even though I know, I know like, you know, we do have subscribers, so I know I'm going to talk to them every now and then, but it's very nice. Um, it's very nice to meet people that read and appreciate the stuff that I write. Also, yeah, I, I honestly am such a geek for, for like, um, like formations and, and Chelsea tactics as well. So I always really, really appreciate that. I want to get right down into it. You know, we played against Real Madrid yesterday. It was a really interesting game. How did you feel about the game in general and the outcome? Yeah, so I thought it was a, a great Chelsea performance and a good result, not a great one. Um, they had the chances to get a great result and a combination of, you know, the things we've seen from Chelsea a lot before in the final third and Karim Benzema just being brilliant um, meant that this wasn't the Chelsea win that it probably deserved to be on the passage of play. Um, and I think it's actually a mark of the job that Tuchel has done since he's come in that it wasn't a great surprise to me, at least, that they played so well on a big stage against a really big team when the pressure was on because we've seen them outplay Liverpool at Anfield. We've seen them beat Manchester City in an FA Cup semi-final. We've seen them control Atletico Madrid over two legs. Um, so at this stage, you you expect um, this Tuchel team to to do the things they do, to be difficult to score against, to, to control the game with possession and pressing and to create chances even against really talented teams. Um, so I, I, I was um, impressed, obviously, but not surprised. Interesting. I, I'm always like very nervous going into these Chelsea matches and I'm always hoping for the best. And I thought that we absolutely dominated Real Madrid for the first for the first 30 minutes or so. So for me, it was frustrating, like you said, that Chelsea weren't able to finish off their chances because I thought that we actually created quite a bit and that Real Madrid were really there for the taking. They had a couple of key players out in Mendy, in Sergio Ramos as well. Um, I think Valverde, they also tested positive for COVID. So I felt like if there was any opportunity for us to gain an advantage, it, it was there and we just kind of missed that. Do you think that that could come back to haunt us in the second leg. Yeah, there's a real possibility of that. Uh, you, you're dealing with a team in Real Madrid that have been here so many times before and have won this competition. They, there is no situation in which they would panic this group of players. And so you knew even in the first half an hour that they would have a moment in the game or a spell of the game where they would be a significant factor. And as it turned out, I mean, they managed to you know, pinch a moment really with Benzema from that set piece to to level it up. And then the second half was was a different game because I think Chelsea finally felt the effects of the Saturday to Tuesday, um, the travel, the unchanged team. And obviously Tuchel tried to offset that with his substitutions, but it was always going to be a different game in the second half. And so I thought there's a there's a chance that that Chelsea could live to regret not not taking more of their opportunities because when you have a team as good and as experienced as Real Madrid on the ropes, you need to try and finish them. And they had the opportunity to, to really put the tie out of reach. Yeah, I, I like what you mentioned about the unchanged team because that was something that I actually was quite surprised about, that we have such big squad depth and that we didn't see any changes from the team that faced West Ham just two or three days before, especially like you met, uh, mentioned with all of the travel involved. What do you think about Timo Werner's performance? Because I've been seeing some mixed things overall. What do, <laughs> I see you smiling. What do you think about it? I, th I think it's always such a complicated question with Werner because he does do a lot aside from goals to offer value to this team, particularly the way Tuchel sets up in the big games. They need, they need someone to stretch opposing defences with direct runs, with his speed, with his smart movement. His movement is excellent. Um, so he's always asking questions of defences and that creates space and opportunities for everyone else. It creates more space for the midfield to control things. Um, so there's a lot that Werner adds aside from his goals. But when you get to these kinds of matches 
and this stage of the Champions League. It's very rare to see a team win this com- actually win this competition without a reliable goal scorer. I, I had a look back through the previous winners for a piece I was writing about Werner today. And the last one I could see was Liverpool in 2005, who didn't have like a clear primary goal scoring threat. Um, and that Werner chance, which, um, which Courtois saved, I mean, it's a great save from a great goalkeeper. But it's also a save I don't think Courtois should have been given the chance to make. If you look where Werner, Werner puts the ball, he puts it right in the middle of the goal. Um, and I just think, yeah, it, the, the very best strikers, if Benzema gets that chance at the other end, I think he scores it, um, particularly with the form he's in. So, and, and that is ruthlessness at this stage of the Champions League. That is what it's all about. The last time Chelsea won this competition, they had a striker in Drogba who you knew would would finish those chances and they don't have that this time at least not at the moment yeah i think that that's something that a lot of chelsea fans are a little bit frustrated about is just seeing like how timid timo has become in front of goal because we know that there's a great striker in there you don't get 30 plus bundesliga goals by like just bluffing it you know like he is a great finisher but it just seems like he's almost in his head too much and trying too hard to perfectly place it into the back of the net but i think that that particular shot just really needed a lot of power and you know it's it's frustrating because he is getting into those positions but he's just missing them a lot as well so i'm gonna ask you a hard question do you start timo Werner in the second leg yeah i think you do um and if i was too cool you know i wouldn't feel great about it um because fundamentally if he gets a clear chance in the return game how much confidence are you going to have in his ability to finish it i don't know anyone at chelsea i don't think anyone at chelsea could credibly argue that they would be totally confident um in his ability to put that chance away but as i said the value he provides elsewhere i don't think can be replicated by the other strikers in this squad um, I really like Tammy Abraham. We'll come on to him later. Um, but he doesn't have that raw speed and the ability to stretch a defence. Olivier Giroud is, is pretty much static at this stage of his career. Chris, Christian Pulisic maybe can do it, but he's it's it would be more of a tactical adjustment for him because he is more of a winger wide forward um, than, a, than a striker. So I think Werner is a tool that, that Chelsea need in the way that they set up for these big games. But the problem is they're going to have to live with his finishing one way or another. Uh, I did, I'm just hoping that his finishing gets a little bit better. But like you said, I feel like we can't really rely on him. But when you have a striker at that point, you should be relying on them. And I think also perhaps an interesting point to make is that when Pulisic scored that goal. I think he had the opportunity to pass it to Werner and he actually did a lot of work and decided to shoot because I don't think that he really, I don't want to, I don't want to make assumptions, right? But I don't think that he really believed that Werner was going to put away that chance. So he just did it himself. What do you think? Yeah, that crossed my mind too. Um, I think, I mean, I saw Pulisic interviewed about the goal afterwards, and I think one of the things that crossed his mind was as he turned towards goal, he was surprised at how open he was because Nacho made a positional mistake. He should have tracked him. Instead, he went back towards the goal line with Varane, which meant no one was on Pulisic, and he had time to turn and face Courtois. Um, Pulisic is the style of player who never needs to be encouraged to shoot, and I like that about him. Um, I think that's the, you know, the, the, there have been some Hazard comparisons always with him in the way that he plays. I think that's the one fundamental difference. Hazard would often pass when he should shoot. He was unselfish to a fault at times for, all, for, for how incredibly talented he was. Pulisic is wired the opposite way. He's, he's a killer. If he gets a sniff of goal, he will go for it himself. Um, and I, I like that he's wired that way because I think a lot of Chelsea's attacking players in recent years haven't been and it's good to have that balance yeah if i don't i don't know if you know liam but i'm like the biggest Pulisic fan that there is so when he scored yesterday i was so so happy and over the moon especially with the recent reports that he like how he hasn't been playing that well he's been really injury prone and there were a couple of reports a few weeks ago that perhaps chelsea were even thinking about selling him this summer but i think that he's really showing what an important player he can be if he can stay fit which is a big if still at this point but um i think that he's a really great attacking talent that chelsea have so who so you're sticking with a front three of timo polisic and mount then for the second leg 
Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I think they did enough in that first leg collectively, individually, um, to show that they should at least be trusted from the start. And then you still have the opportunity to change things from the bench with, I mean, it's quite harsh on Ziyech, as, as Tuchel said. You know, he scored some big goals for Chelsea um, in the Champions League and the FA Cup semi-final. They've kind of been system goals, you know, that, that have been created by Tuchel's tactics, but they've been important goals nonetheless. Um, and, of course, it's it, it, it's harsh on some of the other attackers. Kai Havertz has had a couple of good games as a false nine, but I just think if if, if Madrid are going to have to chase the return leg at some point, if they're going to have to push up and leave space, then you want Pulisic yeah. and Werner in the game at that point to be able to to try and exploit that as best as possible. True, because if it stays how it is, nil-nil, Chelsea will go through on away goals. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I thought that Ziyech actually had a, a really good appearance yesterday. I was quite impressed. I thought that he did quite a bit and was really close to scoring himself. Um, so I was also thinking about perhaps having him start um, to, like one for that experience and the creativity, but then you don't really have a striker on the pitch. So it's a complete conundrum. I really don't know which striker Thomas Tuchel is ever going to go with. I had a theory that he was playing Kai and Pulisic together and Timo and Ziyech together, but then he completely changed that as well. So you just really don't know with uh, Thomas Tuchel's team selection. So speaking on the attackers, you know, Chelsea really have struggled for goals recently. They really aren't scoring more than one. Maybe you'll see two goals in a game. So do you think that this could like falter them or prohibit them from getting to the next stage or from winning the the UCL if they get through or the FA Cup? Um, do you think that you need to have that strong attacking focal point? Well, I mean, history tells us that you generally do more often than not. I mean, I, we were doing our Chelsea podcast um, straight out of Cobham and it, I was thinking through the, the teams that I could remember winning like a massive tournament without a main striker. And I, my mind went back to France at the World Cup in 98, all those years ago where they started um, Stéphane Givarch up front, who <laughs> was nothing really um, in, in terms of elite football. Um, and, that, and that team, similar to this Chelsea team, was based on a dominant defence and a midfield that controlled games. So it, it can be done. Um I just think the attacking options that Tuchel has got, it's a it's it's a really interesting trade off because the negative of it is that there's no one that, there's no one person that you can hang your hat on and go this person will can win us a big game or that we're we're one hundred percent confident this person can win us a big game, but the number of different combinations available um, makes Chelsea a little bit of a chameleon like in in terms of attack. They can do they can do a lot of different things. They can set up a lot of different ways, and they can ask a lot of different questions of teams. And I think Tuchel, in particular, is the type of coach who really likes that because it gives him a lot of scope to surprise his opponents, um, and also to completely change the way his team's trying to attack mid-game, um, depending on who's on the pitch at mm -hmm. any given time. So I, I think uh, I think it's a good and a bad thing. Chelsea's success or failure, clearly if they if they win this Champions League, it will have been based primarily on this incredible defensive structure that Tuchel has built and, and this midfield that can control games, even against the amazing midfield that Real Madrid have. Yeah. Um, but it will also depend on individual attackers producing moments because no one of them can be relied upon to be the, the talisman. Yeah, very well said. I think it speaks so highly of Thomas Tuchel that... When he took over Chelsea, we were struggling. We were in, I think, 10th place in the Premier League. We had lost five or six out of seven or eight games. And now he's really built this incredible defensive structure that teams are finding very difficult to break down, keeping a ton of clean sheets and, and winning games and, and getting Chelsea to their first semi-final since 2014 of the Champions League. Like That's something to be proud of in and of itself. Um, with with the, the lack of goals, do you think that there's reason to give Timmy Abraham a chance because he's seen he's been somebody that we've seen largely on the sidelines. We know that he's a proven goal scorer. Maybe he has his moments or his areas that he needs to improve. But he was Chelsea's top goal scorer last season, and he's bagged I think six this season already. So why do you think that that uh, Timmy finds himself on the outskirts, and you think that he can or should get back into this into the side? 
Yeah, I think it's the one selection issue that we haven't really had a satisfactory explanation from Tuchel um, about. I, 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 he's given various answers. He has been asked about it, but I don't think he's ever really explained what's going through his mind um, with Abraham. And yeah, it, it has mystified me at times. I, I'm kind of torn about it at this point because you're at such a key stage of the season and he has had so few minutes that it would actually be asking a lot of him to try and drop him into a Champions League semi-final or an FA Cup final or a decisive Premier League game in the top four race and ask him to be a cohesive part of the team's tactical structure as well as you know, doing all the number nine things and having that just coming back in with that confidence, having not really played properly in two months. I think it's a lot to ask. And I, I really like Abraham. I think I've got... A, I've probably got a higher opinion of him than a lot of people in, in the Chelsea fan base. He's quite polarizing. Um, I think he's got really, I think his potential is really high. It's just looking like Chelsea are no longer prepared to wait as a club. And maybe they never were um, for him to blossom into that player. Uh, they are operating on a different timeline. You can see that because they're trying to win the Champions League this season. Um and they are in win now mode, and and I think um, it seems for, for reasons that he hasn't. I don't think he's fully explained that Tuchel has decided Abraham isn't a, a major part of that. And I don't get the sense that from Abraham's perspective, I don't think he feels the the faith of the club either, which is why there's been no real suggestion of a new contract. And it look, it's looking very likely that he'll leave this summer. Yeah, that's really unfortunate because I, I also have a soft spot for Tim. I've been following him for years. And I I think, it, you know, he on one side, maybe he doesn't want to be a second striker either that perhaps Chelsea don't view him as their number nine, number one striker. And he doesn't want to sit on the bench either and have that role. Like, we really don't know the full story. <laughs> At least I don't. Um, and I really like the point that you made that you can't just throw these players into these matches because I think sometimes what, what people might not realize is that you really need consistency in game time in order to gain chemistry with the players and, and just for your own game and to get back into it. So if you're just thrown into it, it's a lot to just be 100% on point. I think Pulisic mentioned that, that once you start scoring goals, you start getting some more confidence and, and you start trying more things as well. So if you haven't had that, you know, it's it might not come off as much as we're all hoping that it would. But so kind of wrapping up this section, Thomas Tuchel, he's done an incredible job with Chelsea. FA Cup semifinal, hopefully going to secure top four, Champions League semifinal, perhaps a final. Where do you see him taking this next season? Do you think that he has the ability to win multiple trophies with Chelsea? Yeah, I, I mean, I think he's already proven himself. I mean, before he got to Chelsea, but particularly with what he's done since he took over as one of a, Europe's elite coaches. Um, he has justified that billing, the, the billing that Marina Granovskaya gave him in you know, Chelsea's announcement statement. He, is, he transformed this team overnight, and in particular, the way he's done it. You know, the, the two biggest weaknesses of this team under Lampard were the defensive structure and that they were too easy to counterattack. Chelsea are now arguably the best team in Europe at those two aspects of the game. And it's absolutely incredible that that the scale of that transformation. And, and yeah, they have lost a little in attack because of that. But I think overall, he, he he's done a spectacular job. Um, as for next season, it's so hard to know exactly without knowing what the recruitment is going to be. Um, and which players Chelsea will look to get over the line. Tuchel wants a number nine. Chelsea want a number nine. And I think this team, when you watch it, is crying out for an elite number nine. So uh, if they get if they get one, I think they've got a real chance of competing again on multiple. I mean, they're already doing it. So I think they they have a real chance of running Manchester City close mm -hmm. um, and challenging again in the Champions League and domestic cups. Yeah, and that brings us, that transitions us perfectly to our next topic, Liam. So thank you so much. Um, I want to talk about Chelsea's transfers, Chelsea, the summer transfer market. We're all wondering, it's still early days, but just to kind of get an idea of what their strategy is, what's going on. What are the main positions, would you say, that Chelsea are targeting this summer? 
Yeah, I mean, number nine is the number one priority. Sorry, too many numbers in that sentence. Um, <laughs> no, number nine is the top priority. Um, they they want a striker, a proper focal point. That Chelsea want that. Tuchel wants that. Um, you know, I think they 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 know the impact that Drogba made on the best Chelsea teams. They know the they know the transformational impact that Diego Costa had when he arrived. They know what the potential is if you get the right guy in that position. Um, the one they want, the one all of Europe wants, is Erling Haaland. Yeah. How uh, possible is it? Scale of one to ten. <sighs> It's very difficult to put a number on because it's it, it's a it's a very complicated situation this summer. Um, Dortmund's stance has been that they will not sell regardless this summer; that they want to keep him for another year. Now, it's very easy to say that could just be a negotiating ploy, um, but it wasn't with Jaden Sancho last summer, as Manchester United found. Um, and. So that's one element. The other element is that if you are going to try and get him this summer, there's no release clause. So he would be prohibitively expensive, both in terms of what you pay to Dortmund, what you pay to Mino Raiola, uh, potentially to Alfie Haaland, you know, all these other people who might want money in this deal. Uh, it could end up being, you know, close to £200 million in terms of the total commitment. Um, and in a pandemic market, you know, every club has to think about that, even a club that has an independently wealthy benefactor like Abramovich. Um, so it, it's complicated. I, At this stage, I think it's probably more likely that Haaland goes nowhere than he, go, than he goes to Chelsea um, because, you know, people we know who are more much more connected than I am to the Dortmund side of things are adamant that this is not them just blustering and posturing. This is them genuinely saying... We want to keep him for another year. Um, and in that case, I mean, we've seen in the past that Chelsea are prepared to be pragmatic and look for opportunities in the market where they arise. You look at someone like Romelu Lukaku, um, who has been fantastic at Inter under Antonio Conte. Conte finally got him. He wanted him at Chelsea. Finally got him at Inter and he, and he showed that why he wanted him so much. Um, but Inter are in really bad financial trouble at the moment. It was part of why they were so keen on the Super League idea. And they may well be forced to sell certain players. And Lukaku, mm -hmm. if Lukaku is one of them, we know he's a player Chelsea have liked for a long time. Tried to get him before he went to Manchester United. He's not with Raiola anymore, so there isn't that complication in, ter in terms of doing that deal. And he might be available for a more reasonable price than someone like Haaland, you, and you still know you're getting a high-quality striker. Um, you, aside from that, it's it, it's difficult, sorry. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Do you think that, that Dortmund, they're currently seeing fifth in the Bundesliga. If they don't get that Champions League spot, do you think that they'll be forced into selling Erlen Haaland or they might, hold, they might still like stay strong and hold on to him for another year? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of layers to that, isn't there? They they might be forced to sell certain players, whether those players include Haaland. They might they might choose to sell other players like Sancho or, you know, they've got plenty of valuable assets. Um, Haaland seems to be doing his best to make sure they do qualify for the Champions League because he, he scored two very big goals. They beat Wolfsburg last weekend, um, who won their top four rivals. So... Yeah, uh, that remains to be seen. It might be a case that Dortmund have to reassess the situation, but as of now, everything that we've heard is that you know they they're not budging. They want to keep him for another year, and contractually, they're in a strong position. Unless he really, unless he Raiola uh, really force the issue, and someone is willing to pay big big money, which is not a guarantee either. Right. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's a complicated one, I think. Yeah. So next year, Erling Haaland has a release clause for what, like seventy million or something like that, I think. Right? Uh <laughs> it's a it's around about that. Yeah. It's. I think there's still some uncertainty of just exactly what it is, but it's definitely in that region. Of course, there will be a lot of costs on top of that. He'll want massive wages, yeah. and there will be associated payments to different people. So it, the the total outlay will be well into nine figures. Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that if you match the the release clause, then it's basically on the player to decide which club they want to. If they have multiple clubs interested and they're all willing to to match the release clause, so it could increase the competition for him, essentially. And he gets his choice of where he wants to go. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, Raiola gets a lot of criticism 
um, within football and he's an easy person to criticise because he's just the kind of type of personality he is. But he's done a fantastic job of managing Haaland's career to this point. You know, they 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 took him to Dortmund, which is like the finishing school for world class talent these days, and they made sure to put that release clause in. Um, if anything, he's probably developed sooner than they anticipated into one of the best number nines in the world. But they put that release clause in purely to give him control over his career. And when next summer comes around, maybe some of the other um, big European clubs have recovered enough financially that they can be in the conversation as well. Yeah. And then it, then he'll have some real options. But Chelsea will be one of them. You know, you can't you can't rule them out. And when, a, when Abramovich wants a player um, and is prepared to pay for him, it's always a compelling pitch. Interesting. I was always, I when we were watching uh, Holland last year in the Champions League, I was thinking, why are Chelsea not going for this guy? And I think that there were reports that we were not as sold, so we kind of stepped out. But I was thinking, like, oh, we should get on this. And then now he's turned into this world-class player. Um, I'm going to try to get to some questions, but guys, I do want to keep this interview more structured. Um, Chelsea Fanatic is asking, and I kind of want to twist this a little bit. So if we're going to bring in a striker, obviously Giroud is leaving, probably Tammy might be leaving, but there's still a lot of talent. We would still have a very congested squad. You have Pulisic, Werner, Havertz, Ziyech, Callum still is in there as well. Mount is in there. So are there any chances that any of those players get sold this summer? We're not hearing anything specific about those guys leaving. Um, you know, when the speculation was ha was surrounding Pulisic a few months ago, we were told in no uncertain terms, Chelsea have no intention of letting him go. You know, from a club perspective, he remains a, a key part of what they are doing and what they are planning. And I think there's... You know, there's been a lot of um, pleasure within the club to see him getting back to the player he was for those two spectacular stretches of last season because he he showed then that he could be a pillar of the next re really good Chelsea team. Um, I mean, Mount is indispensable. You know, he is missed, he is basically Mr. Chelsea at this point. It's a quite it's a question of when he's captain, not not if. I think I love that, um, Leo. I love that. <laughs> well, he's he, he's now he's playing just as much he's playing just as much for two cores for Lampard, isn't he? He's just he's and if anything, I think he's he's kicked on again um, under two cores. He's raised his game again and risen to the challenge. Havertz is you know that he was the marquee signing of last summer. He remains absolutely integral. Abramovich played a big role in in that recruitment as well, so he wants to see Havertz succeed. Um, Werner, I mean, again, we've been told, you know, Chelsea have no intention of selling him. It's been a bad season. There's no dressing it up. You know, it's been a hugely disappointing season based on what he was expected to be coming in. Um, but I think, you know, he's still at an age where he can he can recover from a down year. He had a couple of slightly more down years in Germany as well. Uh, RB Leipzig, at least one in the middle of that stretch. Um, so it's perfectly possible he could be good next year, but he's probably looking like he's more suited to be being a secondary scorer in a great team than the primary scorer. So if you get that big number nine in, maybe you actually help unlock to unlock Werner as well. Um, Hudson Odoi is kind of it, it, he hasn't it, been playing that much. No, not in the last couple of weeks actually, um, which is slightly strange given that Tuchel made a big play of putting faith in him when he first came in mm -hmm. and he only ever gets a game at wing back which uh, is not ideal for him in the long term but we've not heard anything at this point he is now you know very expensive to buy he's on a long-term contract on big wages I think he's out of Bayern Munich's reach <laughs> even if they still wanted him <laughs> based on based on the fee Chelsea would demand um, so yeah, I, I, I see him being around as well. I think if you lose two number nines, Havertz can play, obviously, as a false nine or even as a true nine if you need to. So maybe you get you definitely get one striker, maybe you get two, and then you're pretty much covered in those positions. I think if you're going to compete on four, on four fronts, as Chelsea is certainly planning to do, then that's probably the right amount of options. 
Interesting. I, I'm loving this insight. Um, so somebody else that we're getting a lot of questions about is Harry Kane. Um, you know, he's probably the most complete striker in the Premier League, potentially one of the most in the world. I think he has high schools and assists in the Premier League, and he's just insane. But Tottenham are not winning anything, and who knows if they're going to win anything soon. Do you see Harry Kane leaving in the summer? And is there any slight, slight possibility that Daniel Levy would sell him to Chelsea? Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. It will never happen. There, there's no way. There's no way. You, you, cannot, you cannot underestimate the hatred that runs up to board level between Chelsea and Tottenham. You know, Levy, Levy refused to sell Abramovich Luka Modric, who in the grand scheme of Tottenham's history was just another very talented player passing through. Harry Kane might, might become Tottenham's greatest ever player. You know, he he might become the Premier League's all-time top scorer. He might become Tottenham's greatest ever player. He might be their sort of Steven Gerrard type figure. Um, there is, a, I mean, Levy's unpopular enough with the Tottenham fan base as it is. If <laughs> if he ever agreed to that, he he would just have to leave. He could never come to London again. Certainly not North, North London. Um, it's possible that Kane leaves. It won't be easy for him uh, because he's he's on a long-term contract. Levy always makes sure to have his best players tied down on long-term contracts. And it means he has all the power yeah. and you're looking at a depressed European market. I, other people would be more in tune with Tottenham's stance than I am um, in terms of selling to another English club. It won't be Chelsea, whether it could be one of the Manchester clubs, I don't know. Um, I'd, I'd imagine they'd, it, their preference would be to sell him to Spain, but Barcelona and Real Madrid have two billion, two billion worth of debt between them. Um, so when you look, when you're looking like at the post Super League landscape, it doesn't look like a move to Europe unless it's PSG um, is on the cards, really. Uh, so yeah. Kane, Kane, I actually, I sort of feel feel a little bit sorry for him because I, I have so much admiration for him as a player. He reminds me a lot. In a lot of ways, he reminds me of Frank Lampard, um, the player, just in terms of their their mentality and not being the highest rated players when they were teenagers and just making themselves into these absolute legends. Um, so I think he's brilliant. Um, he, he made a tactical error in signing this long-term contract because now he doesn't have any power he can say he wants to leave he can even come out and say he wants to leave but it it won't uh it won't affect levy and chelsea's impossible yeah impossible. so chelsea fans don't even bother asking who would you rather have between harry kane and holland or harry kane and whoever else because it's not happening a thousand percent confirmed here and now um any other any other transfer targets i've seen Varane. uh Brain brand being thrown around. Uh, we've obviously played against him yesterday. Potentially a DM as well. Any news on that? Well, centre back's an interesting one because you know Varane is someone that Chelsea have looked at for a long time. He, he was being monitored by all the elite European clubs before Real Madrid signed him, and they just won the race. Um, I know Chelsea have kept tabs on him in the years since to see if he was ever unhappy there they were winning champions league so he wasn't um but he he there's now a situation where it looks like he might you know he I, d I don't know personally what he's feeling but he might want a new challenge somewhere um and if he does i i'd imagine chelsea might be quite keen to have a conversation uh they also like jimenez at atletico madrid that's someone mm -hmm. else that they've looked at for a long time we'll we'll see what atletico's stance is but also what tuchel has achieved with um, the defenders he's got might change Chelsea's thinking this summer. If, if you're thinking you're going to have to spend big money on a striker, and even for Chelsea, then, then, then you know the, the transfer budget isn't limitless. You think if you're going to divert most of your resources there, you can afford maybe to to not sign a centre back. Um, you just have to re-sign the ones you've got because all of the back three that Tuchel has um, depended on: Thiago Silva out of contract this this summer, although they're, they're probably going to do the one-year extension. Andreas Christensen, Antonio Rudiger, Cesar Espilicueta, they all enter the final year of their current deals at the end of this season. Interesting. So if Chelsea are going to um, 
make sure that they're parts of the long-term plan, then they need to um, get active with those with those renewals very quickly. Um, and you also have people like Mark Gurhey, who's been on loan at Swansea. Mm -hmm. I've been told, I've been told, I've been given the impression really it's more likely he'd be sold um, to maybe raise funds, possibly with a buyback. You know, sort of the or, or an option the way the the deal with Nathan Ake was done in Bournemouth. Um, but they've got a lot of decisions to make defensively before they even think about maybe signing a, a centre back. Defensive midfield, a lot depends on. Jorginho's fortune seem to wax and wane with every new Chelsea coach. Uh, <laughs> but at the moment, at the moment, he's very important to Tuchel. Um, he's been a very, very good player for Tuchel. And Kante has, has become Kante again, you know, prime Kante again. Kovacic, um, you know, I think he played well under Lampard, but he's playing probably even better under Tuchel. Um, so those three have kind of got that, that position nailed down uh, to the extent that Billy Gilmore can't even get looking. We know the one thing we know for sure is that um, Chelsea's interest in in Declan Rice died with Frank Lampard's I was, departure. I was really going to ask you that exact question in that exact wording: if their interest died with his departure. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, it was it was always really, and I don't. I, I must say, I don't really understand this because I think Rice is a brilliant player. Um, I think he will end up at it. At, if not a Chelsea, at one of Chelsea's rivals. And I think he'll be a very important player for one of Chelsea's rivals because he is that good. But um, Chelsea don't have any... It was always Lampard predominantly pushing that interest. So the, the chances of Chelsea going for Declan Rice are still very low. Very low, very low. I mean, it's not like Harry Kane low, but not, <laughs> but pretty low. Yeah. It's a shame because I think if... if Declan had to choose. This is just what I tell myself. I just assume that he would choose Chelsea because it yeah, is I think he would. I think up. he would. Yeah, I think he would be keen on the move if it was a genuine option. As much as obviously he, he he's trying to tread a delicate line because he he want he cares about his relationship with West Ham fans as well. So he would never push for it. But if it was an actual option, I think he would want to, want to go. I mean be playing with his mate Mason Mount again as well um so mm -hmm. it makes sense it would make sense on a lot of levels but it it just doesn't look like it's um it's there for him right now no uh, that that's a real bummer but so would you say in in my hypothetical world imagine we sell one of the midfield trio is there a possibility for Chelsea to sign Declan Rice uh, I mean, we've the, the the other thing is we've heard very little to suggest. We've heard very little either way about Tuchel's opinion of Declan sure. Rice. Um, and while Chelsea don't base all of their recruitment decisions on the coach, the coach does have a say. You know, Sarri got Jorginho, Lampard got a couple of his targets. Um, so Tuchel, I think, will have an impact on what Chelsea do or don't do with central midfield. I just... I think it's a lot less likely that any of those three, Kovacic, Kante, Jorginho, leave now than it was a couple of months ago. I mean, Jorginho is probably the likeliest just because he's got two years left and he's the oldest, I think. He's the oldest, uh, him or Kante. Um, but he's he's become important again and um, under Tuchel. And I think he'll, he'll be happy to stay if Chelsea want to offer him a new contract. I think he'll probably be happy to stay. I never know where he stands because I feel like I see reports every day that says, "Oh, he's going. Oh, he's he wants to stay." Um, but it's 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 really not shocking, but also interesting that there were so many players that were on the fringes under Lampard, and now they've just found themselves potentially having a new contract. And players that I thought we were definitely going to sell this summer, and now they have a renewed life under under Thomas Tuchel. So, if you could only pick one position. For Chelsea to get this summer and I think I might know your answer but I'll ask it anyway which position would you go for and who would you go for yeah I mean it's got to be a striker it's not it's not a surprise but I think um I mean if you've made the club decision that Tammy Abraham is not good enough to be your long-term striker whether I agree with that or not if that's your decision at club level and you want to go for someone else then that has to be the number one priority um and if you can get Haaland, if there's any indication that you've got the money to do the deal, Dortmund are willing to, to do the deal and Haaland is willing to join you, 
you do it and worry about the rest later because he the way he's playing the way he's played for the last two years um he looks like the number nine that could define the next 10 years of european football you know he 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 looks that good he looks like a proper him and mbappe you know if the if there is going to be any sort of um inheritance of the messi ronaldo rivalry it looks like those two will be the two um I mean, the other one is Mbappe. Mbappe's got a year left on his contract this summer. We've heard nothing about Mbappe going <laughs> I anywhere. I was surprised, but I mean, yeah. just go for it, fine. Go get Mbappe. Like. Well, he's he's in that bracket too. But I mean, we've heard nothing about Mbappe going anywhere else. That's the that's the strange thing about it. I think he, the only time you hear about Mbappe going anywhere else, it's always to Spain, and those clubs yeah. can't sign. They can't sign him right now. So. It, yeah, it's a strange one. But I think for, for me, for the type of team Chelsea have, you want a kind of true number nine. Haaland is just the dream um, in so many ways. And it, and it, in terms of his the style of player that he is, like physically, athletically, he's just tailor-made for the Premier League. I know. That's why I've been saying that. I don't think that he would even really need a period of adjustment because he's just like such a beast. Like I really, like he's a monster. He's so physical, such a physical player. Like I, I really don't see him having any issues uh, joining the Premier League. Um, you see Chelsea perhaps like if we can't sign Holland, do you think that they would prefer to sign somebody like the Lukaku this season or wait for Hot to potentially sign Holland next season? Yeah, that's an interesting strategic um, conundrum, isn't it? Um, I think there'll probably be a lot of uh, back-channel conversations going on, as there always are in the transfer market. And if you're Chelsea and you're smart, you're trying to gauge from Haaland's camp how interested is he in Chelsea? Where where are Chelsea in his sort of list of preferred mm -hmm. destinations? Because if you get a feeling that you could wait a year and then he just goes somewhere else anyway, then what's the point? You just go and get someone else right now. Um, of course, if you're Haaland and you're Mino Raiola, it's not in your interest to eliminate interested clubs. So you'd go, you'd probably go out of your way to tell Chelsea they had a chance, even if they didn't. Um, so that, that's the, that's the transfer game. And that's what, um, that's Marina Granovskaya's job is to try and figure out, uh, to try and navigate the the sort of murky waters of 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 these types of deals. They're very complicated, and and it's always a big achievement when you manage to pull one off. I I don't envy her at all. So final question related to transfers. It's been a really popular topic here. Um, if you had to pick one player to, uh, that's touted to leave Chelsea, that's not Giroud or Abraham, because we've already talked about those players. Who would you say? is most likely to leave Chelsea this summer? Mm. Just running through the squad. Uh, well, I mean, I guess the most obvious one would be Emerson. Yeah. Uh, third choice left back. Um, or, or he's <laughs> like, him out as an option as well. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of been reborn as a, le uh, as a backup left-sided centre-back under Tuchel as well. But, I mean, he's not getting many minutes. And uh, you, would, uh, you would think that, Either him or Alonso um, are surplus to requirements. Whichever way Chelsea decide to go tactically next season, you just don't need that many options for that position. There just aren't enough minutes to go around. Um, we've heard things on and off in the last few months, well, in the sort of last year or so, that Emerson or Alonso could leave, depending on which one's out of favour at any given time. Uh, but I think when... Yeah, the complicating factor with all of this and with a lot of the players that Chelsea have on loan right now is that Marina Granovskaya always demands value for players that Chelsea sell. And um, there isn't a lot of value to be had. It's a, it's another buyer's market, just as it was last season, which means Chelsea could, could have an advantage in terms of buying, but they're going to struggle to trim this squad again um, if, they, if they hold to the kind of prices that Granovskaya traditionally has done. So I assume that means that we're probably going to see Kepa stay as well. Yeah, I think so. I think one of the one of the more interesting things in the last couple of weeks is that Tuchel appears to be giving him enough minutes to make the possibility that he could become the number one again feasible. 
you know, it's it's con it's conceivable now in a way that it wasn't a couple of months ago because when you've got a defensive structure that protects the goalkeeper this well, yeah. It, Kepa's got five clean sheets on the spin in his last five appearances. So, including an FA Cup semi final against Manchester City. I know a lot of Chelsea fans had heart palpitations when they saw him on the team sheet, but <laughs> I wasn't he, expecting it, honestly. Yeah, but he, um, but he did, he barely had a save to make and he was very well protected. And if that's the case, then I think, you know, if you gave the board truth serum and asked them, uh, who who would you rather see as the long term number one? They would say Kepper because you don't spend a world world record fee on a goalkeeper um, just to kind of cut your losses on him. And there, there isn't a market for him anyway. He's on massive mm -hmm. wages. He's got a long term contract. Um, in January last year, when he you know when he first lost his place under under Lampard, we were under the impression that his people kind of explored potential options, loan options away from Chelsea, and there weren't any. Not even in Spain, there were there just weren't wow. a lot of there weren't a lot of clubs that were looking for starting goalkeepers. Uh, so he was unlucky in that sense, but also his stock was so low and he was so expensive um, that he just didn't have any transfer value. So it's definitely in Chelsea's interest to try and let him rebuild his confidence, uh, get his career back on track. Um, and Tuchel appears to be giving him the opportunity to to try and do that. Well. That's it's really interesting because I I have kind of been of the opinion that Mendy is doing so well um, that I kind of see him as that starting goalkeeper for Chelsea. But I understand why the board doesn't want mud in their feet, so to speak. Um, I want to to pivot um, to talking about your career as a journalist, of course. Uh, so did you always know that you wanted to be a journalist for football? No, I wanted to be a footballer. <laughs> I, that was my first preference uh but i realized i realized pretty quickly that that was not going to happen um I'm, I'm okay at five aside but that's about it uh and then didn't really real didn't really think about too deeply what i wanted to do uh, until i left university i did ancient history at university which is uh, just lots of transferable lots of transferable skills uh but leads directly to nothing uh, apart from I studied finance so <laughs> okay okay well yeah lots of different paths um into writing and talking about football that's that's the lesson um but yeah so when I left university I just thought I've always been football mad um I've always enjoyed writing so I thought I'd, I'd try and give it a go and um I got some work experience at goal.com at a time when they were giving work experience to a lot of people around my age. And most importantly, they were giving young people the opportunity to go to Premier League games, which no one else was. Uh, and that was incredible experience. My first game was a nil-nil full of Aston Villa, <laughs> uh, which was memorable for no reason other than it was my first game. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, yeah, did ended up being with them for about three years. Uh, and while I was doing like a, a journalism training course, and then I got lucky with timing when I finished the course, goal offered me a full-time job. So I was there for, oh well, no, sorry, I was there for about a year and then I was there for about three years full-time. And then managed to leave there just as ESPN were creating their club correspondent roles. So uh, oh. I, got, I got lucky with the Chelsea job and, and that kind of led to everything that's happened since. Wow. So we have an interesting question from Neil. He says, is it hard not to be biased when you write? Um, when I first started writing, um, when I first started writing about Chelsea, because I, I mean, I grew up a Chelsea fan. That's not a secret. I don't, I don't always, I don't volunteer the information just because I don't think it's very useful to talk about for my job now. But um, when I first started writing about Chelsea, I was probably more inclined to go the other way and be more critical because I was consciously trying to compensate for, you know, supporting the club. And I feel like over time, I mean, everyone will have their own opinion based on reading my stuff, but I feel like over time I found a, a more sort of natural balance. Um, and, you know, the more you're dealing with things, the more you're reporting on the club day to day. It's not like, I don't feel like a, I don't feel like a fan in the same sense because I just I deal with the club in a totally different way. I look at the club in a totally different way. And it, that's not a negative thing for me. 
um, and just always looked at it in a very analytical way. Um, and just, I'm just more interested in what's actually happening and why it's actually happening rather than my opinion of it yeah. <laughs> or, or how I feel about it. Um, it must so that, that, that's made it easier. It must be really cool to have that like inside look like I would, I would personally love it, but I, I don't know. I, just me like fangirling about Chelsea. Uh, what's a typical day for you look like at the athletic? What do you do? What's your process? Um, so, it's, I mean, at the athletic, we, we work in a different way to a lot of places because it's all long form stuff. Well, generally, I mean, we do news as well. Um, that's been a more recent kind of development, but the bulk of our work is still these sort of long form analytical features interviews and stuff so i'll have a call with my my editor every morning bright and early although not quite as bright and early for me now because i've got a puppy so 9 a.m is 9 a.m is basically lunchtime for me <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> um where we'll just talk through you know we'll, we'll we'll talk through where we are with different things i'll be working on four or five different story ideas at any one time um and that was a big adjustment for me from previous jobs because ESPN was very news focused um, and I might be chasing two or three news angles, but it's just a, diff a totally different discipline to long form story, storytelling. Um, so we have to constantly be working on four or five things because you're, you're working on other people's timetables. Really. If you're, if you're trying to interview people, you're working based on when they can get back to you and when they can give you time. Uh, and we just have to try and put ourselves in a situation where, we're spinning enough plates in the air that we get to three pieces a week, uh, which is what I write. Um, and the, the, I mean, the matches always help obviously, because they provide some structure to the week. They keep the stories moving. Every game, you know, gives us something new to talk about. And I like doing the, I like doing the tactical pieces um, after games. I try not to do them for the sake of doing them. I think if there's something interesting, um, and a new coach is always interesting because they always come in and, and make, you know, interesting decisions and take the team in a different direction. Two calls, no exception. So there's, those things are good. They provide a good little balance between the interview stuff. And, um, and I try and have two days off uh, a week, but not, not always possible because football doesn't care about your plans. Exactly. And, and with the football schedule being very focused on the weekend is it difficult to to come up with ideas to write about like do you have more long-term things that you have in your mind that you want to focus on and then and then things that just happen like somebody gets fired or a player I don't know has an incredible game or a terrible game or whatever it is yeah I mean I'm not a natural planner I don't really plan ahead in life I'm not I'm not hugely organized so when I started this job it was a big adjustment for me and our editors, um, particularly my editor, Alex Kajelski, uh, chief editor of The Athletic, are brilliant. Uh, they help so much um, in terms of us sort of plan out and structure things. And also, you know, they, they suggest ideas and it's always a two way conversation. That makes it a lot easier. And because you're talking to someone who isn't as pl sometimes you can be too close to the elephant when you're reporting on a club, you know, to, to, to actually see the big picture. And you, and when you're talking to an editor that isn't, you know, just solely thinking about Chelsea every day, um, you can get a bit more perspective and, and end up with more ideas because of it. Um, so, but there's now always, there's always a balance between those ideas that you're working on for a long time and the new stuff that just happens. So a Super League gets announced on Sunday and suddenly all the plans that we had for that week are just, yeah, out the window. That must be so difficult. I'm I am a massive planner, so that would be really difficult for me because I have like my list of things that I want to do, and I go checking them off. And I've been that way since I was five years old. Apparently, <laughs> my mom tells me. So I I've heard you at a couple of press conferences. Are there any managers or players that you specifically really like to interview, or or might be more difficult to interview on the other spectrum? Um, I mean, I think I look. I I got different things out of I I all the Chelsea coaches I've covered I've enjoyed them in different ways um I, th I think I, I really enjoyed Conte um just because it was such a great story on the pitch that 2016-17 season um similar to this what we're seeing now under Tuchel in some respects in that it it's a very 
clearly coached success. You know, you can see the coach's fingerprints on the team um, in everything they're doing. And Conte was just quite a good personality. He would sometimes give boring answers in press conferences, but he would he would also be just as liable to lob a verbal grenade at the board or or like insult <laughs> or or call. Jose Mourinho, you know, senile dementia. Like, it, it, you never knew what was coming with him. Oh um, and then, and then Sari was interesting because um, he was kind of the opposite to Conte in a lot of ways. In that, Conte always put a lot of effort into uh, being like quite friendly with the media, not in a one-on-one sense, but just being quite cordial. You know, shake your hand when you walk past, say hello, and all this sort of thing. Sari didn't want to spend any more time with us than he had to. Uh, it was it, all about the football for him. He he just didn't want to do anything else, which is fair enough. Um, but he was actually quite good in press conferences because you asked him a question and he didn't care. So he'd just give a purely he he he'd just give a purely honest answer, even if it caused a problem. Like, Did you watch Callum Hudson Odoi's England debut? No, I don't watch international football. Just 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 lie, Maurizio. <laughs> so. <laughs> He's so much, so much, so much more beneficial of you to lie. Um, <laughs> that's, and, that's hilarious. And then Lampard was a great story as well because you know you've got the club legend returning. Um, I've always found him very good to deal with in a media setting um, because he he talks really really well. He's always super eloquent. He thinks about questions, um, and he gives you a proper answer when you ask one. Um, I mean, I had my run-ins with him towards the end, but you know that that's just part of the game. That's just that that that's just two professionals. That's absolutely fine. Um, and Thomas Tuchel, I think you know, I, ha- I haven't dealt with him quite as much for one reason. I just haven't been in that many press conferences in the last month or so. Um, but I've been really impressed. He, he's a far more charismatic talker than I expected him to be. Me too. Yeah. I I hadn't seen him really interviewed before he got to England at all. Um, even when he was at PSG. So I knew he was quite a bookish sort of professorial figure, but I was surprised at how charismatic he was. And I think it's easy to see how he's got players on side um, and got them believing in what he's trying to do. Um, so, yeah, all the coaches I've covered, um, I've sort of taken different things from and I've I've enjoyed different ways. That's really interesting. I I I don't know what I would do in a press conference. Like I, I imagine it must be quite difficult because depending on the order that you're picked, perhaps you're towards the end and you have to try to think of a question that nobody else has thought of before that's still really thought provoking. Um, but maybe one day, who knows? Who knows? That'll well, be, that'll be or the, the per or the person immediately before you asked the question you were going to ask. That that's <laughs> always great when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be sweating. <laughs> I would lose it. Uh, do you have any like funny interview story that like the funniest interview that's ever happened to you? Um, I suppose quite. A f- I mean, I've, I've not had anything like super hilarious, but I did this. I did quite a lot of interviews with like organized by PR companies and kind of where you get like a sort of 10, 15 minute slot with someone um, and they're promoting something. It's quite, they're quite common in like showbiz journalism, but they're quite common in football journalism as well. Um, and it, this particular one was with Peter Shilton from England's World Cup, well, f- former England goalkeeper. Um, and uh, <laughs> and he, I was supposed to be interviewing him at a, at a pub in Soho, uh, some sort of, I think it was a, an international tournament watch along, like watch the game with Peter Shilton. And he was late getting there. Uh, so I ended up interviewing, I was at the pub interviewing him on the phone as he was in the taxi on the way to the pub. We we finished the interview. I went downstairs and met him as he was coming in. So I, I, I met him at the end of the interview and then we just went our separate ways uh, after I'd spoken to him for about 20 minutes. That was just really strange and just the way this industry can be sometimes. Um, but I just did a, a long interview, actually, which hasn't been published yet. It'll be published in the next few days with um, Alexi Smertin, former Chelsea player. A very interesting career. He had lots of funny stories. That was a very enjoyable interview to do. So um, hoping people enjoy that when it goes up.
Interesting. So guys, make sure that you subscribe to The Athletic. It, it really is very cheap for the quality of content that you get as well. And it's definitely one of my favorite news publications to get all of my football info from. Just one more question to tie up this interview. So I want to ask you, where do you see Chelsea finishing in the league this season? And do you see them winning any trophies? Yeah, I think um, I think they'll finish fourth. I think the West Ham game was critical. Yeah. They had they had to win that game, particularly after the Brighton draw. I think now they're in a good position. That that Liverpool slip up against Newcastle was a, a welcome bonus for them. They've got a tough four, last four games, but Tuchel's been good against tough teams. Um, so I, I see no reason why Chelsea would necessarily drop point, drop more points in those games than they have elsewhere. I think they'll they'll finish pretty strongly, get fourth. Um, they're favoured to win the FA Cup. It's not a done deal. I, I, I think they should be they should be favourites to win the FA Cup, and it, I think I yeah I, I'd say they 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 will win that. Um, it won't be easy, but I think they will win it. And Champions League. My instinct is that their lack of ruthlessness will come back to bite them. I just can't shake the nagging feeling that in the first two thirds of the pitch, they're playing well enough to win the Champions League. Definitely. I just can't shake the nagging feeling that you have to be more ruthless to actually win this competition. And the other teams in this competition have the capacity to be that ruthless. Yeah, I think that it spoke a lot that Chelsea had so many chances against Real Madrid, but Real Madrid, like basically created something out of nothing just from Kareem Benzema's brilliance. So it'll be interesting to see if they get through to the final. I would be shocked, like not shocked in a bad way, but just like from the perspective that I wasn't even expecting that in my, in that wasn't on my radar for this season. My, this season was like transitionary for me. So either way, it's, it's a good outcome for Chelsea. But let's see. Let's see what happens next Wednesday. My heart's going to be racing the entire day. But Liam, thank you so much. It's already been an hour. I can't believe that we've been speaking for that long. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to come on my channel. When I first started my channel, I made like a list of like dream people that I would like absolutely love to get on and your name was on it. So <laughs> it's like really, really cool for me. And thank you so much. And just let everybody know like, where they can find you or whatever you want to promote. Uh, it's very flattering. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, it's a pleasure to be on. Um, I mean, people can obviously find me at The Athletic if they if they want to subscribe. I'll be very happy with that. Um, they can, I think there's still a discount code associated with our podcast, Straight Out Cobham. You can hear me on Straight Out Cobham rambling on about Chelsea on a weekly basis. Um, and... Obviously, you can find me on Twitter at Liam underscore Toomey, making bad jokes um, and and observations of varying degree of, uh, of usefulness. So. Awesome. I'll make sure to add your links to the description below so that you guys can find it. But I'm sure you already know Liam as well. So, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, if you liked this video, just drop it a like. Subscribe to the channel. You know, all the typical things. But thanks again for watching and for taking an hour to, to hear us chat, Chelsea. And, yeah, until next time, I'm out.